Since the dawn of Christianity, there have been thousands of saints that have been recognized by the Catholic Church. Which got me wondering, what exactly is a saint anyways? What does it mean to become a saint? What is the process like, and who votes on this sort of thing anyways? I was so enamored with these questions, I had no choice but to travel all the way to Italy so I could try to become a saint myself. While I was there, I met plenty of other saints, including Pope Francis, the remains of Simon Peter, and even the incorruptible body of Padre Pio. And along the way, I desecrated plenty of ancient monuments while somehow not getting thrown in prison. So what can you do to become a saint? Well, you're about to find out when Caleb goes to Italy. Ciao Bella. My name is Caleb Quist, and I was once forcibly kicked out of an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's about 6.30 a.m. in Draney, Riri, Rome right now, which makes it about 9.30 p.m. on the west coast of the United States. Let me show you what the bathroom looks like. So this is an example of a Roman toilet. You've got your number one right here and your number two right here. An Italian TV is very strange because you get a wide variety of channels. You get, um... Lots of American shows and lots of American cartoons that are dubbed in Italian. Like last night I was watching Teen Titans Go, completely dubbed in Italian. But then they also have like Austrian TV and Al Jazeera. Last night I really wanted some authentic Italian food. And I was looking around for some like, some macaroni and cheese or lasagna or something like that. But like the real deal, you know, the real stuff but I couldn't really find anywhere within walking distance to get anything like that. So I uh, just was walking down the street and I ended up stumbling upon this Arabic burger joint. So I walk in and everything that's written is written in Arabic, Italian, and English. And I started trying to order in Italian and could immediately tell that I, I butchered the language. And they uh, actually ended up giving me some free food. So the first part of my journey took me to Vatican City, otherwise known as the Holy See, the home of the Pope and the home of the Holy Catholic Church. Standing there at the Vatican was pretty mind-boggling because, to be perfectly honest, it really shouldn't even be standing there anymore. Back when Emperor Nero was around, if you were a Christian and you were living in Rome, you dealt with all kinds of horrible persecution. You were arrested, you were crucified, you were burned alive, you were stripped down and ripped apart by wild animals. You get the picture. Which is why it's so ironic that right now, at this point in history, Christianity is not only the dominant religion in Rome, but in the rest of Italy as well. Christianity as a whole is kind of a goofy religion to begin with. It requires us to believe in a Jewish guy who died for the sins of humanity, but was brought back to life three days later. It never should have lasted this long, and yet somehow, by the grace of God, it has. The same idea extends to the Vatican. It should have died out hundreds of years ago, and yet somehow, with countless wars and countless years of history working against it, it's still standing here after all this time. So for those of you who don't know, Vatican City is the smallest sovereign country in the world. In fact, it can barely be called a country since it shares so many of its resources with the Italians. Basically like if the Pope ran a Little Caesars. Back in the first century, this was the site of the Circus of Nero, or sometimes called the Circus of Caligula which is why there's still a gigantic Egyptian obelisk here for some reason. Because nothing says Catholicism like a giant symbol of the ancient Egyptian sun god. Back in those days, the Romans would hold their famous chariot races here, while at the same time brutally murdering Christians for some reason. Imagine going to a NASCAR race just so you can watch people being executed. So originally, St. Peter's Basilica was designed by Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. I say original because this is not the original building. This is actually the second basilica after the original basilica was demolished. Two of the architects for the new basilica were Raphael and Michelangelo. I would put a Ninja Turtles joke right here, but I just haven't come out of my shell enough. 
From the time you walk into St. Peter's Basilica, you can feel an overwhelming sense of holiness. It's a place with so much history and so much spirituality connected to it, you can't help but feel humbled by the sheer scale of it. When you go inside, you feel all warm and fuzzy and safe like you've just come home. But as soon as you step back into the outside world, there's a crackhead on the pavement screaming about how awesome the Pope is while doing push-ups. And yes, this really happened. If you're a history buff, prepare to get jacked. Over on the right, you have a sculpture that was done by Michelangelo when he was only 23 years old. The sculpture is called La Pieta, and it shows the Virgin Mary cradling her son Jesus' lifeless body, not long after he was crucified right in front of her, which in and of itself is a very haunting and very powerful image. Right away, you'll notice La Pieta is kept behind bulletproof glass. <laughs> Right away, you'll notice La Pieta is kept behind bulletproof glass after a mentally deranged man tried attacking it with a hammer back in 1972, while screaming that he was Jesus Christ and that he'd come back from the dead, I might add. You'll also notice that Mary is extremely young in this sculpture, even though her son would have been in his early 30s. This is pretty common, though. Mary's supposed to represent the church, and the church is forever young. Eventually, I climbed all the way to the top of the dome, this guy right here, which was also designed by Michelangelo. Climbing up the dome is absolutely terrifying because as time goes on, the stairs get progressively narrower and narrower until eventually your shoulder is brushing up against the wall and all you have to hang on to is just a measly old rope. The steps are also really slippery and made for people with tiny little Italian feet, not giant clown feet like what I have. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I would highly recommend you do this climb if you're an infant or an elderly person, or somehow both. Once you make it to the top, though, the view is definitely worth it. You can look out in every direction and see the entire city of Rome. On a clear day, you can very clearly make out the Colosseum and the Pantheon. Now, to be perfectly honest, it is a little bit weird to have this gigantic super church built on a place where so many of our fellow Christians were killed. Which begs the question, why is the Vatican is where the Vatican is? Well, you see, it all goes back to this guy named Simon Peter. Back in the first century, there was a fisherman living around the Sea of Galilee named Simon. One day, Simon and his brother Andrew were out fishing, and along comes this guy you may have heard of. What was his name? Oh yeah, his name was Jesus. And right away, Jesus promises to make Simon a fisher of men. And not only that, Jesus changes his name to Peter, which translated from Aramaic means Cephas, which means rock. Peter gives up everything so he can follow Jesus and become his disciple. One day, Jesus and his disciples are standing in this ancient city called Caesarea Philippi. This city is filled to the brim with idol worship. I mean, it's bad. Jesus himself calls this place the gates of hell. So, yeah not good. But while they're standing here in this place of idol worship, Jesus asks Peter, who do you think I am? And Peter answers correctly when he tells him, you are the Christ, aka the Messiah. Jesus gives Simon Peter the keys to the kingdom and says, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus was giving him authority over the rest of the church. This is why the Catholic Church considers Peter to be the very first pope. Eventually, their rabbi is captured and put on trial for being a nice guy and trying to help people. And at that point, the rest of the apostles kind of just abandon him. In Peter's case, he has a valid excuse. He needs to stay alive so he can keep the church going. And yet, when other people ask him if he knew Jesus, he denies him three times. Three days later, Peter goes to check out Jesus' tomb, and there's nothing inside. Well, nothing except for some linen garments anyways. Clearly not a grave robbery, since grave robbers wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap his body. Eventually, Peter and the other disciples go out fishing, when suddenly, Peter looks out to shore and sees the resurrected Jesus. At first, though, Peter doesn't recognize it's him. But then, Jesus tells them to throw their net into the lake. And when they do, they catch so many fish they can't even pick up their net. 
Peter freaks out when he realizes who's standing in front of him. He's naked at the time, so he immediately panics, wraps some garments around himself, and jumps into the water. Which parallels the story of Adam and Eve, both of whom covered their naked bodies after the big guy upstairs caught them eating the forbidden fruit. Later, Peter and Jesus are chowing down on some of the fish they caught. Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. To which Peter replies, You know that I love you. Well, sort of. In the original Greek, Peter says something akin to, I have affection for you. Which is kind of like saying, I have affection for this fish, which is delish. It doesn't really carry the same meaning or the same weight to it. Know what I mean? Jesus, on the other hand, is talking about love love. Like the kind of love you have for someone who just died for you in the sins you've committed. But even though Peter doesn't reciprocate this kind of love, Jesus still chooses him as the head of his church and the feeder of his flock. So the point I'm trying to make is this. Simon Peter was not a rabbi. He was just a lowly fisherman with no status and no authority whatsoever. He denies the Lord three times and sins on multiple occasions. All this, and yet Jesus still chooses him as his number two guy. Once Jesus ascends into heaven, Peter takes on a very clear leadership role over the rest of the church. Now he's standing up to the religious authority in Jerusalem and preaching the name of Christ, even if it means risk risking his own life. Now, the Bible never really mentions what happens to Peter exactly. He gets a couple of books in the New Testament, but that's really about it. However, there is a legend that Peter was fleeing from the city of Rome where Christians were being executed left and right. But as he was leaving, he saw a vision of Christ who was carrying his cross back to Rome. When Peter asked Jesus what he was doing, he said, I'm going to Rome to be crucified anew. Despite how terrified he was, Peter went back to Rome, knowing the entire time what fate had in store for him. And sure enough, he was captured and crucified by the Romans. Peter claimed he wasn't worthy to die how Jesus died though, and that's why they crucified him upside down. And the place where he was crucified? The Circus of Nero, where St. Peter's Square now resides. The Vatican was built here to commemorate Peter's final resting place. So apparently, Simon Peter was buried somewhere near the Circus of Nero. Or was he? You see, for hundreds of years, nobody really knew for sure what happened to his body. So in the 17th century, the Pope tried digging around Vatican Hill to see if they could find Peter's remains. But instead, all they found were a bunch of pagan tombs. That's right, not Christian tombs, pagan tombs, as in tombs from the ancient Roman Empire. So as you can imagine, this was a really huge problem for the Catholic Church. If Peter wasn't crucified here, then the church would lose a lot of its credibility. In fact, a lot of people had argued that Peter had never even come to Rome to begin with. But then, along came Pope Pius XI, followed by Pope Pius XII, who took the major risk of digging around Vatican Hill all over again. Now, a quick Quick note about Pope Pius XII. This is the same Pope who negotiated for the Vatican to remain neutral during World War II. A controversial decision, to be sure. But you have to remember, the Vatican was surrounded by Nazis and crazy Italians. If Pius XII had not stayed neutral, there's a pretty good possibility the Vatican would have been destroyed, or even worse, it would have been taken over by Nazis and turned into the Westboro Baptist Church. So when they started digging around Vatican Hill, they had to do so completely in secret. Otherwise, if those crazy Italians found out what they were up to, they would have just taken over the whole project. You have to remember, there were a bunch of ancient Roman tombs buried here, and Mussolini was all about about bringing back the glory of the Roman Empire. So because of this, the Vatican couldn't hire any outside officials or archaeologists. Instead, they had to use their own priests and their own officials to do all the digging, none of whom knew anything about archaeology. This went about as well as you would expect. So they started digging and wildly flailing their pickaxes around everywhere, eventually destroying a bunch of priceless artifacts and desecrating a bunch of human remains. But then, lo and behold, they found Peter's remains. Or did they? Spoiler alert, they didn't. Ah! Got it! 
TLDR. They were proven not to be Peter's remains. Sorry, moving along. Along comes this really adorable-looking Italian woman named Margarita Guarducci, who's an actual certified archaeologist. And, well, to make a long story short, she found Peter's remains. This time for real. The real bones from a real man who is 60 to 70 years of age. A man with a strong build, no less, which makes sense for someone who is a fisherman. His bones were found by a wall known as the Graffiti Wall, with the inscription, Peter is here. Needless to say, this did not sit well with the Jesuit priest who started the original excavation. The fact that a woman could come along and prove they were wrong about everything was simply unthinkable. So for the rest of Guarduce's life, he did everything he could to try and discredit her. It was a smear campaign for the ages. Then, along comes Pope Benedict XVI, and thanks to our modern technology, he was able to carbon date the bones and prove that Guarduce was right all along. So where does that leave the necropolis today? Well, it's still there and I had the chance to go there, actually. Okay, so full disclosure, I wasn't allowed to take any pictures or any video inside the Vatican Necropolis. This is very much an archeological site that's technically not open to the public. There are guided tours of the Necropolis, but they only let in a really small handful of people every day. And if you wanna get your tickets, you have to do so months and months in advance. So if you're looking for the Necropolis, it's not actually in St. Peter's School. Square. It's way off to the side of these giant pillars here. But the thing is, the entrance is being guarded at all times by the Swiss guards, who look something like this. Don't let their silly uniforms fool you, though. These guys are actual Vatican soldiers. They've been part of the Vatican since the 1500s, making them one of the oldest military units still being used today. So I walk up to the metal gate, and before I could even get there, the Swiss guards started walking up to me, and the first thing that popped into my head was, oh crap, please don't brandish your sword on me. Stop right there, criminal scum! But instead, they saluted me and said something to me in Italian. So I pulled out my admission ticket for the necropolis, and I said to them, necropolis? Por favore. Buongiorno. And much to my surprise, dudes spoke perfect English. They were like, oh yeah, just go stand over here and you gotta go through a metal detector and we'll let you in and blah, blah, blah. Th they didn't sound like that, but you get what I'm saying. Know what I'm saying? Now, while I was at the Vatican, there was a synod going on. So the whole time I was there, the place was bumping. There were priests, there were nuns, there were all kinds of interesting people running around all over the place. Though unfortunately, I did not get any of the nuns' phone numbers. Would have been a lot cooler if I did. Sisters, give me a call sometime. Eventually, we met up with our tour guide, who wasn't a priest, but was actually a priest in training. And he was from Australia, which just made the whole thing that much better. Good day, mate. Gonna baptize some babies on the barbecue, mate. So once our whole group was together, he pointed out this square block in the middle of the road. It says something on it in Latin, which I can't really make out, and as you can see, the letters are pretty old and worn out. But that's when he told us, this stone marks the place where the obelisk was originally placed in the Circus of Nero. Which means right here, where you guys are standing, is the place where Peter was crucified. But when Peter was crucified upside down, the very last thing he saw before he died was Rome turned upside down on its head. In other words, even at the time of his death, Peter could foresee the demise of the Roman Empire. So with that, we walk down a flight of steps into the Vatican Necropolis, which, I might add, is very hot, very humid, and very uncomfortable. And this was in October, too. I can't even imagine what it was like being down here in summertime trying to dig with hand tools. Now, the Necropolis is called the City of the Dead, and for good reason. There's dozens of tombs down here, and many of them are still sealed with human remains. Originally, the Roman tombs were 
were placed above ground. That way, the Romans could get together with their deceased loved ones and hang out and party with them. We as Christians tend to look at death as just a way station. We leave our bodies behind, but it doesn't really matter because we've got a VIP backstage pass to the resurrection anyways, so who cares? But the ancient Romans didn't look at it this way. They saw death as the be-all, end-all, and as far as they were concerned, the only way they would be remembered was in the land of the living. That's why they did everything they could to make their tombs look as elegant as possible. But then, along comes this mad lad named Emperor Constantine, and he wants to build Vatican Hill right where these tombs are. So he's like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna get in my John Deere tractor and bury all these tombs underground now. Bye bye. But here's the thing though. By burying these tombs underground, it had the unintentional side effect of preserving every last one of them. If they'd been left above ground, they would have just fallen apart. So congratulations, Emperor. You failed successfully. If these Romans were trying to be remembered by the living, they certainly got their wish. When you first walk in, you're faced with all sorts of gods and deities from way back in the ancient world. There's portraits of Hercules, Pan, Pluto, the list goes on. But the farther you go in, the more you begin to see lots of Christian imagery. It's very subtle, though. You see, while the Christians were being persecuted, they had to communicate using their own made-up code. You might see the letter T to represent the cross, the letters MA to represent Mary, or the symbol of a fish to represent Peter. Margarita Guarducci was able to crack this code, and that's one of the reasons she was able to find where Peter was buried. Which brings us to the grand finale. So we walked into this small square room which had a sheet of glass on the wall. And as you looked through the glass, you could see a spotlight shining down on this little plastic box. And inside this little plastic box, there were a set of bones. You could very distinctively make out a jawbone piled together with a whole bunch of other bones. Sure enough, it was the man himself, the remains of Simon Peter. So at that point, our tour guide told us, you know, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes alone. You can stay in here, you can pray, you can talk to him, you can do whatever you want to do. So one by one, the rest of the tour group filed out of the room. You know, they thought it was pretty cool, but they didn't really seem too interested in it. So before I knew it, I was alone in the room with Simon Peter. There he was, right in front of me, this amazing man who knew Jesus and who lived with him for several years and had all of these amazing experiences with him. A man who gave his life for the church and what he believed in. So there I was just hanging out with him and talking to him a little bit. I kept thinking back to the Gospel of Matthew and how Peter was the first person to claim that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus told him, Blessed are you, Simon son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I don't want to make it seem like this is some crazy mystical thing. Anybody can go on this tour and go visit the necropolis for themselves. But the thing is, you need to book your tickets well in advance. So if this is something you would be interested in doing, I'll leave some instructions in the description below on how you can reach out to the Vatican Excavation Office and get tickets for yourself. There's also this book that I'd really like to recommend called The Fisherman's Tomb. It goes into a lot more detail about the search to find Peter's remains, including how the whole project was funded. I'll leave a link in the description below. If you're interested in biblical archaeology, I cannot recommend this book enough. So hanging out with St. Peter was pretty rad, and it taught me a lot about what it means to be a saint exactly. But it got me thinking, though. 
If only there was a saint who was still alive who I could go out and talk to. Hmm.